Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Lovely to uh, see folks here in the Zoom room. And uh, we also extend our awareness to you that may be practicing with us at another time. Thanks for dropping in. Hmm. The, uh, hmm. the practice and the talk tonight are inspired by a uh, hospice spousal loss grief group that uh, I was have been part of these as a support person in these last several weeks and uh, the facilitator today Rebecca um, shared a quote from uh, someone named Dr. Alan Wolfelt uh, who I wasn't familiar with but uh, um, I've shared their link down below in this recording so check them out if you like there he is a uses he pronouns is a death educator um an author quite a few books and a grief counselor and um i yeah i'm not that familiar with their work but a little bit of reading on on their site um Today looks like there's lots of good stuff on there. Uh, and so the context that was being spoken about was about grief. And, <laughs> you know, we're all grieving. Whether or not you feel that that's up for you, uh, it can't, we can't not be grieving in this world and this awareness and this interconnectedness. <laughs> we can't not be. As well as in our individual lives, uh, uh, there's so much grief of, uh, you know, the obvious losing ones that are dear to us, ones we love, um, that happens all the way through this life experience, but all the uh, other aspects of grieving, <laughs> which are also infinite, loss of roles and aging and ableness, uh, classism. Uh, all, I mean, we could just go on and on about all the different forms that affect us in a way that we could call grief. And uh, what I really appreciated uh, appreciated about this um, Dr. Wolfelt or Alan Wolfelt's offering is a reframing that I think is true. Uh, check it out in your experience. As the Buddha said, don't take anyone's word for anything. Um, we check it out from our own experience to see is this true or not. But uh, what he offered was that we don't recover from grief. We don't get over grief. And so many folks in, in this grief group, when they came, they're like looking for something of like, how is this going to end? Or what's after this? Or how do I get over this? And... Uh, We don't get over this life. What we, and and also, you know, we don't return to normal. First of all, what's normal? Well, that's another whole talk. But, you know, there's that feeling of like, when will things get back to normal? And that does not make sense in the view of the Dharma of getting back to some previous manifestation of infinite variables that are constantly changing. We are all forever changed by all things. We are all constantly affected and affecting and changing. And yeah, and so rather than thinking about recovering from 
anything. <laughs> Rather, he talks about reconciling with it or being reconciled with it. That's, this is a very big shift in relationship, in relating to how things are, to be reconciled with it. Mm. And this, this doesn't mean um, kind of a giving up or a, a like, oh, well, that's how things are. <laughs> It's uh, we still uh, need to respond with wise action, wise speech, the whole of the Eightfold Path. But all of that begins by first meeting with things how they are. We have to begin there. And so reconciliation in this context, there's other contexts for reconciliation, which um, are not part of this talk that we're, I'm just focusing on tonight. Um, but here it's reconciliation as an integration of these new realities, these, of these truths of how things are, how it is, how it's affecting us. Hmm. Rather than trying to get over, around, beyond, above, <laughs> But uh, through, we go through with how things are. And this is uh, a subtle but profound shift. So often there's a tendency to want to bypass, to find a way around something or, you know, to push something down, get over it. Oh, please <laughs> get over it. Such a nice thing to say to people. Get over it. Oh, not good. <laughs> so here, this requires recognition and acceptance and integration of how things are. Um, and reconciling also means coexisting with, with these... Mm, with grief and joy, with aversion and compassion, with, you know, all the vicissitudes, the, the waves of how things are, that we can feel so many things at once. And so many things are true at once. And it can feel like a cognitive dissonance when there's hmm, when there's grief, for instance, or any other powerful state, and something beautiful happens. Like, oh, then there can be guilt. Like, I shouldn't be feeling that. Or, um, yeah, all kinds of complexities there. So it's this sense of uh, coexisting, which really reminds me of the upeka or equanimity practice in the Dharma. Um, and Thich Nhat Hanh teaches that equanimity is the practice of inclusiveness. That's so good. The practice of inclusiveness. It's like this and it's like this meeting it in this heart as much as possible. Sometimes we have to titrate or like micro dose meeting things because it, it can be overwhelming or too intense. And so, but keep moving in that direction of meeting how things are, inclusiveness with how things are. Um, and to do this, really requires that we we not try to just transcend or bypass, but um, really opening to with tenderness, with mm -hmm. compassion, with loving kindness. And so equanimity or upeka, as it's called in Pali, is one of the Brahma Vihara practices, the, the divine abodes of cultivation 
it's upaka bhavana, which means cultivation of even-mindedness or um, inclusiveness, as Thich Nhat Hanh beautifully phrases it, um, to be have some steadiness, some presence within the flux, within this interplay of suffering and joy, pleasure and pain, and all the neutrals that are in between that. So that we have a more capacity to be with what is pleasant without clinging to it, and what is unpleasant without aversion and needing to push it away and um, get rid of how things are. It helps us cultivate this sense of um, the eye of the storm being in this this center of this very stormy life with some presence, with some stillness of heart-mind that can weather the storms. And it's, uh, it's a it also cultivates skillful action, as I said, wise responding to how things are. It doesn't just mean like, this is how it is, just totally, it's all good. I can't help it, that's the way it is. This is not equanimity, that's spiritual bypassing. Uh, equanimity cultivates our ability to respond with wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood, all the parts of the Eightfold Path in response to the suffering of the, of that is part of this life experience. Um, hmm. Something else was there? Hmm. Other images that are sometimes referred to with this practice are like um, surfing the waves, you know, uh, of, yeah, the waves of life, the ups and downs and, and uh, surfing those waves. Um, another image is like a mountain, that steadfastness, that overview, that seeing the big picture in a really grounded and stable way. And so with this meditation practice, you don't need to be any of these things. <laughs> you can just be the hot mess that you are and be feeling unstable, be feeling whatever it is, joyful or angst or whatever. And it's a cultivation, like a seed in a garden it's an intention to grow that capacity. So you don't have to already be feeling equanimous to practice this bhavana, but we just touch into this deep wish, this deep seed that we all have for ease, for presence, for stability, uh, hmm, for release from uh, excess dukkha in uh, excess suffering or uh, clinging and aversion to how things are. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say as an intro. Mm. So to reconcile with how things are rather than recover but uh oh it's like this and then what's needed it's like this what's needed this is something i say to myself often just in the flow of a day oh it's like this what's needed do i need to go lay down for a bit go out to the forest do i need to offer amends for harms Mm, you know, what's needed. 
It's like this, what's needed? All right. That was a short one tonight. <laughs> if you're new here, it's not usually that way. <laughs> it can go on sometimes. But I think that's all that's needed. So um, I should say, well, see? <laughs> that's so funny. I should say a little bit about how we approach this as a meditation practice. There's different ways, of course. We'll use kind of the common form of repeating phrases. I'll offer, this will be a mostly guided meditation where I offer some phrases and words have to be used. Except for, we don't want it to just stay wordy and heady thoughts, but just let the words drop in as if you're hearing from your heart center, chitta, heart, mind. And you can change the words into your own words that resonate for you. Uh, but don't spend a lot of time thinking about what's the right words. If that's happening, just go with what's offered. And you silently repeat the phrases, but mostly focus on the feeling, the felt experience in the body, in the, especially in the area of the chitta. Uh, to, to grow the seed, to cultivate this quality within your heart-mind. 